confirm if it. So, <coughs> okay, so we also, uh, we also mentioned last time there are many genes in each effect of lifespan. Uh, but what I argue is uh, we never found a gene is actually the cause of aging. There are so many genes that influence lifespan, but uh, we don't find one which we can say, well, if we remove this gene or, or, or find a way to intervene that gene function, then people are each going to live forever. We, in fact, I don't think we can. We can never find that gene <laughs> because uh, aging basically is not a single gene effect. Uh, we also mentioned this. Oh, here's another linear correlation. <laughs> There's also a universe, uh, you, what I argue is a universality in aging. So, you think about aging uh, for, for people, for identical twins, do you, they are born probably minutes away from each other, but they are going to pass away probably years apart. Right? Even though they are genetically identical, but they are not going to live to. They, they come to the world almost at the same time, but unfortunately they will pass away at different time. Why was that the case? It basically, there's a lot of a, a randomness about aging, which we call stochastic. So, but despite that, there are actually some uh, something are very common at the lar at the large population level. That's called strapular multiple correlation. And basically, the linear correlation between the two uh, Gumpert's parameter, log uh, of the mortality, initial mortality rate over the Gumpert's coefficient, it's a negative correlation there. Uh, what do you think that two parameter means? So I kind of talk, told you uh, is G means the rate of aging. What does the R zero mean? Uh, M zero should be initial mortality rate. If for, uh, so, if G is large, that means the average lifespan is long or short. Right, because uh, G is the rate of aging. The faster uh, some individual, some population age, the shorter the lifespan is. What does the M0 mean? What, what, if the M0 is a small, what do we expect for the average lifespan for our population? That's the initial mortality rate. That means, uh, when the babies are born, their chance of dying is very small. That's what the initial mortality rate means. Sorry. The relative mortality rate should be high, right? Because you have more people living past infancy. It's small because very few people are dying at the. Uh, uh, maybe I'm missing the three. So uh, if you have, um, oh, okay, yeah, I said it backwards. That makes sense, that the relative mortality rate would be small if you have fewer people dying within mm -hmm. it. Right. Okay. Uh, I guess, yeah, I, I think I, I probably use an inappropriate example because uh, in human, the infant mortality rate is actually relatively high compared to uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> I, think, I, have, yeah. I was going to say, but I have a yeah. question. Don't, doesn't, well, I guess in a human example, doesn't the relative mortality rate increase with age? Yeah, yeah. but except that yeah, there's a tiny bit of abnormality between infant and teenage. Okay. The infant tend to die higher. Uh -huh. In fact, almost uh, a third of the baby uh, die before they are even born. So, so if you consider that, that's actually a uh, pretty big time. So that, that seems to be just a, probably a mammalian problem. 
only only sorry what? Yeah, people not individuals but sector probably have this problem. I'm not sure why. I'll tell you what you should make question. Yeah, if you think about <laughs> so yeah, anyhow. Uh, <coughs> but what what are the small small initial mortality rate is uh, Basically means uh, initially every everyone is very healthy. So the, the smaller that is, the longer the population going to live. So what does this mean? There's a negative correlation between the two parameters, which means cannot get both. Yeah, because these two parameters are negatively correlated. So. So if the aging rate is slow, and then it, so basically this curve says if the aging rate is slow, and then the chance of dying initially is going to be high. But if initially the chance of dying is high, then the uh, 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 it is small, then the rate of aging is going to be high. See the see the problem? Yeah, there's a trade-off between this. This no, you cannot get both. Right. So that seems to be. This curve basically said. So, so this this for 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 species want to have a long lifespan, they, they can either do this by shortening the rate of aging, or uh, decrease the initial mortality rate. But they have to balance it. Which way? Which way you have to choose? Right? They cannot do both. Basically, that's what this means. And in general, this 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 phenomenon is. Also very common in evolution. This is uh, people actually call this trade-off. So basically, I mean, the limit of um, amount of time and effort that each species can spend, you can only just go one direction. And you cannot do all. Of them. It if you think about, that's probably true in everyone's life. <laughs> so <laughs> you have sometimes you have to 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 pick uh, <laughs> what you are. Not I cannot have all habits. So this is this is a uh, it's, it's a tremendous amount of publication and theory has been put into this trade-off thing. I'm not sure who started this, but uh, this whole thing is called trade-off. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <coughs> uh, well. Uh, when I first started to re to do research in on East Aging, I also did a lot of quantitative work to say East Aging is a stochastic process to a very large extent. In fact, uh, almost like uh, more than seventy five percent of East Aging is random, and basically it says genetic makeup only account for less than a quarter of a lifespan. Basically, even though some some e cells have very good gene, this, this I can only predict uh, twenty five percent chance say how how long that going to uh, e species going to live. In a similar finding was also reported in human based on identical twin studies. So basically, for identical twins, their genetic makeup only account for twenty five percent of chance how how long they are going to live. The rest of them basically depend on. They will live. So the other 75% like environmental. Environmental in human basically means lifestyle, the things you are going to do, right? People you're going to interact, right? The rest are basically non genetic related. Yeah, so it could be completely so random. Someone happened to be killed by a car. <laughs> Things like completely all not very better. Right, yeah. And smoke or non smoke. So I feel that's people who like I guess that's just what I was thinking like, you know, like the families that live really, really long and have to necessarily most healthy because people have like the most healthy lifestyles but on average members but people are all Yes, if they all share the similar lifestyle environment. Yeah. Like a like a 
like people say Italians tend to have a long lifespan because they drink red wine. This study like like that. People drink red wine and for their blood. <laughs> the people smoke how they think they live shorter. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. So those are non genetic factors. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't have the red wine thing. Oh. I know it's like how I know. Yeah, the red wine story actually is even more interesting if you want to uh, put that. Actually, uh, uh, I'm going to assign a research paper to you for you to present. So, in class, we right, in class, <laughs> and that come part of your grade. Yes, uh, I think 20% of the paper. What? Yeah, 20%. Yeah, 20%. Yeah. So, so, you can do a good job. <laughs> yeah, but of course, you want to discuss with me when you read the paper, right? So you can actually do as a group. So, but you want to pick who you want. What? Yeah, but you can. Uh, you're supposed to do it twice, and you cannot pick the same people twice. You have to work. You do it twice. You have to pick two different uh, team members to work on. Otherwise, kind of a. Well, I, otherwise, may not. I don't know. That's that's a way I have to do work. So leave with it. <laughs> yeah, so I besides I, I'm not sure how this is going to work, so let's see. Yeah. yeah. Uh how oh, maybe I shouldn't be too too particular about how, how you're gonna present. As long as you give a good presentation, I'm gonna I'm okay with it. I mean that I, I guess it depends how I view it. Uh, my view is how I'm going to learn from the experience. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I, okay, let's let's go about those uh, rules. So you can even do it uh, alone, or you do it with a team member at your choose. How about that? Yeah. So, but it doesn't matter. So if you want to do it alone and you get all the credit, <laughs> so yeah, that's fine. Okay, so here's the whole purpose uh, why I'm doing research in aging and why we are doing compu computing and why we sit in front of a computer all the time. I think to understand aging is not a problem you can just do an experiment alone. It's something, uh, there's something fundamental and theoretical about the aging we haven't understand and we need to uh, resolve that problem. So I think aging is something called the emergent property of network. And, and here I just focus on gene network. And at the largest scale, I think aging is the emergent property of biological complexity. And the network is just one example of biological complexity. Uh, <coughs> although many people also think the complexity way. But I'm doing it actually uh, mathematically. I, I show it by principle instead of just arguing aging is probably that. So, so pub, people have probably arguing aging is related to gene network for almost two decades now. So that idea has been around for a very, very long time. Yeah. So <coughs> now the question is, so what do you think is the emergent property? If you Google, what do you see? What, what do you think? When I say emergent property, what? What does that come to your mind? In fact, if you Google Wikipedia, they probably call this emergency. Emergence or something. Yeah. Yeah, emergency. emergency is different. The emergence is basically equivalent to emergence problem. So there are actually philosophers, uh, physicists, and mathematicians that just to study what is emergent property. <laughs> so 
So I might have weathered into a territory where the, even the basic concept is not very clear. Okay. <laughs> so, but, well, but the good thing about emerging the property is when you see it, you know it. This is something, <laughs> you know something is the emerging property when you see it. Right, so, for example, termite castle is the emergent problem. You seem to have want to say something. I was reading the definition oh. of emergent property. So, so uh, yes. Okay, so maybe I'll get it as you continue explaining. So, so what, 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 what do you think? That, that definition. Um, so they, Need to, I need to work on this. So, uh, okay, but why do you think, can, if you think about how does termite castle form? The termite going, every termite castle going to look similar mm -hmm. like that. How, how did the termite form the castle? Or how did the bees make their nest with all those regular shapes? How, do, how, how can they do that? They have to start with the basic cells, right? They have to build like one cell of the hive. For bees? Don't they build like Yeah, yeah, but, how, but why, how do they know they are going to make it? Hexagonal, hexagonal. Oh, no. Yeah. Isn't that intuitive? What do you mean intuitive? Aren't they born with that? You basically say they want to make a nest like that? I, I, I think so, don't they? Isn't that the best nest for their activities and their needs, I guess? You, you were saying when they are making it, they are going to say, we are going to make a pest of garden. I well, really thought that's Maybe they're not thinking about it like this, but yeah. isn't it intuitive for them to know that it has to be a certain, done a certain way? Aren't all bees born with that natural instinct? Hmm. Uh, I don't know that. Answer. Oh, okay. But I, I don't think. What do you mean natural instinct, basically? Just like um, all animals are born with certain natural instincts. Well, basically, you mean the natural instinct is at the population level or the individual individual level? Do each individual say, we are going to make a uh, Nest look like that, or do each individual basically say, "I'm just going to do this"? I thought it was each individual just to be able I do. don't think that is. You don't think So they have an understanding of the need for population to do uh, You have to understand that the population. That's not that you have to understand the whole thing as a system, mm -hmm. as a one unit to understand. Mm -hmm. So basically, okay, let's let's move on to more example. So how about school of fish? That's if you have see a large population of fish, they almost going to move almost like one large individual. Mm -hmm. How how do you think that work? It, it, I mean my, my daughter has a this fascinating uh, uh, I don't know, almost like uh, being attracted by a magnet of those flocking of birds. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they will sit at the one pole, and then all of a sudden, whoops, I mean, <laughs> all the birds flowing to a different tree. And my daughter is basically fascinated by this. Mm -hmm. But why do you think the birds can do that? 
do, do they going to all going to say, okay, we have, we, have, we have been sitting for too long, let's all move to a different place? I really don't think that the case. <laughs> but why actually work that way? It's the same thing like the fish, right? The fish is not going to say, okay, let's all move to Australia. <laughs> and then somehow in the middle say, let's turn back, and they're all going to turn back. How, how, how did that work? <laughs> Excellent. That's, I think that's one of the best answers. <laughs> but, but you didn't tell something deeper. In principle, yes, in miracle, but that's almost like a poetic answer. But if, if I'm teaching English, I will give you a good answer. <laughs> I'm teaching biology. I expect something about how about more principle, a mechanism. There is actually one good concept, it's called swarming. You hear about that called S W A R N Swarm. Yeah. That's actually Yeah, that's actually exactly that's when when you have all this individual I mean, do you think each fish is probably gonna say going to react? Say, Oh, my neighbor is going to the left, I'm also going to go to the left. That's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> you see, all those people started yelling. If you see the, if you go to a concert, and all of a sudden everybody is going to one direction, are you going to go to that direction? Yeah. See, that's, <laughs> that's <okay>. yeah. <laughs> and you don't even know what it is. <laughs> so that's that's basically what the individual reaction is there. It's so it's just like on an individual level, it occurs like. Mm. Okay, so what you're saying is that the actions of other individuals in your population are influential on your actions. Right, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the, like the lower level is each individual and the higher level is the population? Right. Okay. Basically, every, I think every bees only knows what that individual bees is doing. Mm -hmm. But somehow, as a whole, this entire population works out things almost like a magic. And that's what happened with the fish. Each fish only know, well, my neighbor is going to one direction, I'm going to follow that. But if every individual does that way, this entire school of fish with millions of it, going to actually move almost like one, one body. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in fact, if you think how the proteins function, they are almost like the same. Protein has so many amino acid residues, has so many branches. How did that protein work as a, a fun, even be functional? Right? That means there must be coordination also among all the amino acid residues. One of the best uh, example, what I have heard is color. Color is an emerging property because color, you can you can only tell color based on the molecule, not on the atom. You never heard a uh, word say blue oxygen atom, uh, blue uh, red hydrogen atom. Even though in chemistry you actually label them, say red, blue, but that's like just fake color. Atoms does not have color. But only molecules have color. That is in part because the interaction of molecules absorbs the sunlight in one frequency, but emit a different frequency. And that difference gives rise to the color of the molecule. So basically, those properties, basically something happened at a higher level, like molecule level, but at the atom level, which is lower level, that property does not even exist. But the existence of that property at a higher level is because of the, the interaction of components at the lower level. And that's what I argue is what gave rise to emergent property. Now why, so basically what I'm trying to say, aging is an emergent property because of gene interaction in cells. 
and it is those same interaction give rise to the characteristic of aging. So basically, when we look at the, the individual gene, you are not going to find out why individual age because the property doesn't exist at the individual gene level. That's basically what I'm trying to say. So aging, so what you're saying is that aging occurs on the cellular level and shows the effects on an organism level. Right. Well, at the organic level, it's going to be interaction between cells, organs, right? That will be physiological aging. But here, I use a single cell. I study cellular aging. Okay. Yeah. And so that is what makes it an emergent property. Right. Yeah. Basically, I'm saying it is those gene interaction give rise to the aging at the cell level. So, so in fact, when we do all those molecular biology, say, oh, give me this gene. Uh, that's not going to tell us a lot about the, at least some principle of the aging. Because if aging is a, a system level property, it's, it, 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 I mean, it is a, it, the, the, the pattern of dynamic interaction with the family. Yeah. That's basically what I'm saying. Uh, but if, you, if we just change the component, it's going to influence how aging occurs. You see, uh, that is a, but one famous British people say something. So gene, basically that person said, genes can influence aging, but it's not a cause of aging. So every gene in our cell can to influence the aging process, but it's actually not a cause of aging. Basically, that's what. So how do I do this uh, mathematically, and how, how are we going to do this mathematically, computationally using R? Uh, it turns out uh, some of the foundation work has been done almost 20 years ago uh, by two Russians. Uh, that's called a reliability engineering. But the reliability, reliability engineering also started in the Vietnam War in, when the US Air Force tried to figure out how long their missile will last. You think about everything's age, not just human age. The U.S. Air Force missile also age, and they don't want to go to a battle, find a missile, say, oh, I mean, half a half chance I'm going to hit my target. <laughs> so, so U.S. Air Force is, has a very high interest to make sure their missile probably going to work as I'm almost closer to 100% as possible. <laughs> so they want to make sure everything is going to work. That's why this whole, whole business of reliability started. So what came out of the, that, those kind of Vietnam War study is something called a reliability engineering theory. Basically say how long our missiles going to be reliable, going to be say closer to 100% effective. It's basically in biology basically say how long the individual going to be healthy. It's the same thing. Yeah, so bas I basically apply that theory here. So basically say, instead of say, uh, how long the missile is going to be reliable, I'm going to say how long the cell is going to be reliable based on the interaction of every component. Now, can, the question is, uh, can we, we know the uh, Species doesn't have to be aged. They are non-aging species like viruses. So the question is, if all the components are non-aging, but can a system age? That's actually well known. Here, so in, in this case, I, I will have four components. Each component will be uh, exponential decay by uh, viability. That's basically a non-aging component. So each component, I'm going to say, to assume it's non-aging. So this is a plot of a mortality rate over time. Uh, so I'm going to, so this is a simple demo. So I have uh, n equal one, two, three, four, four component. So if I, if n equal one, I just have one component, one non-aging component. A system with one non-aging component it's going to always have a constant mortality rate. So this, this curve is n equal 1. That's a non-aging system. 
And then I can also have a n equal to, uh, I'll, I'll probably should use the same color, which is also blue here. Uh, n equal to, and that will be this line. That's n equal to. So if I have two components, initially the whole system is going to fail, going to be at least twice lower because I have two components there, even though each component is not aging. Right? Each component has a constant the, the rate a chance of that. But if I have two, if you just think of initially the chance of dying should at least be half of that. Right? So, so initially, that chance of dying is to be very small. But when time goes on, if I have two components, if one component dies, and then that ch then the chance of dying of the, the, that one component system is going to be constant again. So, uh, am I making sense to you? No. Oh. Okay. Uh, Think about an airplane has twin engine. If it's a one engine airplane, the, its chance of dying is constant. It's basically the same as that, the, the how, how that single engine will fail. And since the, that single engine has a constant chance of dying, the, the, the dying of this single engine airplane will also be constant over time. Right. But now let's think about the other. A two, it is a two-engine airplane. Two, this two-engine, they still have constant rate of dying. They have identical, almost like a single engine. Uh, right. But because this time have, this airplane has two engines, and when when it, when initially when it has two engines, its chance of drop or death is not going to be the same chance as that single engine because you have two. So it should be half of that, right? So initially, its chance of dying is very slow. But what if one of the engine failed, right? Basically, it goes back to that single engine. Right. So it's going. Right. Right. Basically, right. Basically, so if that single, uh, two, if I have two engines here, once that single uh, uh, become lost one engine, it should goes back to this line. Maybe I should use a blank. Uh, it makes sense now? Yeah. yeah. So basically, this is my baseline for single engine airplane. If it's a two engine airplane, once it's the last one of the engine, it's going to go back to this line. Right. Okay. But the chance of lock, when I have two engines, the chance of loss one single engine. It's also a, a random, right? The, the, the how, how soon I will lose that engine is also random because the engine die follow a random exponential decay. So, so, so uh, this increase is not jumping immediately, it's actually gradually increasing. So it gradually goes back to the its black line. Now, this time, uh, now think about what if we have three engines? So this time I'm going to say n equals three is green. So then we have this green line. This is because the when when I have this time I have three engines now, my chance of that initially is even lower. And but eventually when that three two of the engine falls goes back to single engine, it's still going to go back to this uh, single engine line. You see the point? Yeah. So eventually the two engine, three engine, they are all going to go back to the, the single engine line. But the starting point of the triple n equal three is going to be much lower. You see the point? Basically, if I have more component in the system, this line is going to become sharper and sharper. Right. Because initially going to be very, very low, but 
eventually they all going to hit the same point. So the more component we have, is basically the more redundancy a system has. The more redundant the system has, the sharp is this transition. And this transition is basically the rate of aging. So, so here, I'm hitting a point here. But the, the, the slower this initial point is, the smaller of the initial mortality rate. So based on this curve, we already can tell there is a trade-off between the initial mortality rate and the rate of age. Uh, I don't think I'm conveying this key point here, but uh, so basically, the, the, the curve, uh, this curve is the if I if there's an increase of redundancy and the rate of aging is going to increase and the uh, initial mortality rate of will be decreasing redundancy sorry uh, uh. so 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 the more redundancy a system has Actually, the faster the, the rate of aging and the, the smaller the initial mortality rate. And that's actually basically what we have been observed in, the, in biology. That's basically the trade off between the two comfort dimensions. That's the, so, 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 based on this simple example, you can already anticipate this trade off. This is that I, uh, I I I was uh, almost amazed when I found this one out. It's, it's something so simple, but it's it's so universal observing biology. The, the basic trade-off principle can be explained by things so simple, just so simply a uh, uh, phenomenon. So. Okay, but. <coughs> So uh, look, uh, who I'm citing? I'm citing to Garilova, Garilova, 2001, General of Theoretical Biology. But that paper is actually based on a 1990 book, and that book is based on their thesis. So, so this this thing has been studied for a very very long time in uh, reliability field. So. Now, uh, the trouble is, uh, this doesn't look like it's a cell, right? I mean, it's just literally designed for missile study. You have two components. If the component fails, the missile is not going to work. You have two, we, we have two engines. If uh, two or three engines, if the engine fails, then the system, the plane will do job. It's not going to fly. So basically, these are all engineering concepts, it's not biology. How do I make a jump from engineering to biology? Okay. Uh, oh, that's a conclusion. Uh, so based on this simple model, we can tell characteristics of aging can arise from interaction and non-aging component. Basically, this one already can tell aging can be an emerging property of a simple uh, a system with redundant component. And in fact, you can even tell this trade-off between the initial mortality rate and the rate of aging. And how do I make a jump from the engineering model on the right to the gene interaction network we observe in a cell? And here is the key. Uh, and honestly, it takes me, uh, philosophically speaking, take me from two. 2003 to 2010, almost seven years to come from that to this. Mathematically, it took me a whole year. But that whole year, uh, I basically spent a whole year uh, dreaming how to calculate, and finally, it took me that two or three hours write it down. <laughs> so, so, so this is how it works. So we, we, we have these four component pathways. And so in engineering, basically, if this path, all the components fail, this pathway is going to be blocked. 
and basically the missile is not going to work, airplane is not going to fly. But in, in pro, inside the protein, we have genes, they interact with each other. Uh, picture all the circles are protein and genes. They, you say the inter functional interaction or genetic interaction, we put a link between them. Now here's what I call the, why this one circle here is a black. That black one is an essential gene. Essential gene may, means if, if we delete that gene, the cell will just die. In yeast, about 10% of genes are essential. So yeast have 5,000 genes, uh, 6,000 genes. Uh, if we delete about 1,500 of them, the yeast cell will die. The remaining 75%, if we delete them, it seems to be okay, it's still alive. So, so I are they alive with the mutations, or are they just normal? Many of them are apparently normal in a laboratory environment. Yeah. In fact, uh, if, if people donate their kidney all the time, not all the many times, if you if you take the one kidney out, you are going to be normal. So if you take half of your lung, most of the time you are still normal. Except mm -hmm. you probably won't be able to run marathon anymore. Yeah. See the problem? Yeah. Uh, yeah, like my, my mom and dad are losing their eyesight, they are still alive. Right? So, but, you see the point. <laughs> for, for many yeast cells, they lose, in fact, they lose 75% of genes, they are still okay. They seem to be happily in the laboratory. Right? <laughs> so, yeah. So now, okay, so basically those are essential genes, those are non-essential genes. Now how do I model the cell going to die? The key in model of aging is really how to model how the cell will die. That's the, the fundamental phenotype we have to model. In fact, the key in any modeling work is to model how to model the phenotype. Remember that word if you lay down you want to. The, the key of any modeling work, any research work or even predictive work is about how to model the observation you want to study. So, so in biology, basically how to model phenotype. Well, in physics, basically how to model the observation, whether they can predict that. If I can extract a little further, why we see a wall screen meltdown because the model they put and the reality just too far apart. They didn't model the actual the market using a more realistic model. They just put a too idealistic model there. So here, so okay, if I come back to my own work, I want to how, how to model aging is basically the the fundamental uh, block I have is just to how, I, how do I model cell death? I mean, if, if cell is not going to die, I'm not going to study aging. Right? Basically here, how do we model cell die? So here, uh, in, in engineering, it's quite straightforward. You have two engines, two engines pass, uh, pass out, the airplane is bad. That seems to be straightforward. You have a, a missile, if the missile have a, a several boosters, all the boosters pass out, the engine, uh, the missile is dead. In, in, in yeast, how do I model aging? I basically say, well, there are essential genes, there are non-essential genes. If the essential gene pass out, that's a dead cell. If the non-essential pass out, it's okay, I'm going to assume the cell still live. And, uh, so that's how I model aging. But I basically say, well, the question is, how, how, how did the component get to be modeled? I'm actually not modeling the, the dying of every node. I'm modeling the dying of the gene interaction, the function of every interaction. So here, here you say four components. Here I say there are four functional, uh, four functional interaction of this gene. I'm going to say the the, fun the decline of those function is exponential, which is non-aging. Decline of that 
bio the biological function of those gene interaction is non-aging, it's exponential decay. This is because if I want to prove aging is emerging uh, property, I have to assume the component are non-aging. So, so that's basically by default, I, I have to start with a non-aging component and then prove the aging can occur at a high level. So I assume all those interactions are non-aging, and then I want to show as a whole, the, system, the network can age. That's basically the purpose of it. So, now how do I build the network? The biological network are often called a modular network. So I basically, uh, so I have a essential module, so essential gene, non-essential gene, they interact. And I basically can build up, this, uh, assuming there are many modules, in the network, so that will be the modular construction of gene networks. Uh, the trouble is, if I just follow that, that is basically a machine aging uh, property. So now we are getting a subtle part of it. What the, so what do you think is the difference between machine aging and biological aging? What's the so the biological aging is this exponential function, but so but not everything is exponential uh, increasing. So here here's the biological aging. So the increase of mortality over time follows this exponential function. In machine aging, very often they follow this power model. So here this is time, this is time. So the difference is in machine aging time is a base, but in biological aging time is a in the exponential term. See the difference? So how how do we go from machine aging to the biological aging? So what do you think is the fundamental, at least one of the key difference between mass produced cars and the laptops, cameras, and human being or biological being? If we look at, look look have a, take a good look at the every people in this room and then take a good look at the every Apple computer, what's the striking difference you can tap on? All this all of the Apple computers look the same. Very good. And all the people are very Yeah. Why well, that's the case. Um, well we all have Uh, okay, yes. And all that happens, I would assume, have the same structure, like the same structure. Yes, excellent. Yeah. So all the machines are basically have exactly the same configuration, but every, every one is different, every individual is different. In fact, if you look at identical twins, they are also different. So it's not just genetic makeup make, make individual individual. They are also random change, environmental change make every individual, even identical twins are different. Yeah. So so that actually is one of the uh, fundamental difference between biology and the non biological world. So what I have to do so Oh, I kind of I had a one. So basically, all I have to do, I, I'm going to introduce random changes into my network. I mean, of course, you don't think the genetic makeup we have is random, but at the population level, every gene is basically almost like, a, a, if you can picture, they are almost like a bees, you just throw up throwing in the population, and that kind of move random. Right. So uh, let's see what I what I can uh, explain it. If, if you picture, uh, we have many genes. Right. Let's say we have a gene for translation. We have a gene for uh, translation, and for for that gene, we have different alleles. Uh, we have different alleles. Uh, we have a uh, I'm going to use a, a, a circle to represent allele. So 
I'm going to say uh, one blue, purple one, one uh, orange one, one uh, dark one. Oh, this actually not dark. It's the brown. Uh, red one. A uh, black one. Uh, <coughs> for uh, all of us actually have two copy of chromosome. So let's say that we have a, a uh, we have have two copies. Uh, we have another function. Let's just say a sensor or something. Uh, I'm, I'm going to run out of a color, so I'm probably going to use some. I'm going to have a triangle, square, circle, diamond. Uh, what other shape? Uh, arrow. What, what's the name for this kind of shape? <laughs> but how do you, so each individual, so I'm going to call this, say, uh, I don't know, say this is Jiang, and this, what's the name, let's say this is Ben. Uh, but how, how do each, how do are those genes distributed in a population? I mean, although each child is characterized by parents, is mom, but at the entire population level, People don't say, I'm going to marry that person because that person has the DNA nucleotide that level. There's no way. <laughs> At least we are not in that stage, right? Basically, we are kind of blind to those genes. So those genes basically can be put mathematically perspective. It's just randomly put into those conditions. So you can just we can pretty much uh, uh, think those are kind of colored glass beads and each one just get two of them. If you think that's a, MM, uh, a, a large gene pool of MM beans and each person for every locus they just take two of that MM bean putting that locus. Basically that's what it is. So, but so, so that, that basically is a kind of a random distribution of genes in the, in, in, from the gene pool into the individual. But even, even for cells with the, exactly the same number of genetic makeup, the, if you think about the transcription from the DNA to the MI level, it's actually not exactly the same because very often the transcription factor just have say one molecule, two molecules, three molecules. Well, that means not one or two, three molecules going to have chance to say transcribe one gene, and then it won't be have a, a chance to transcribe a different gene. So, so basically, it's almost like a, a lottery. For, for DNA to be transcribed into MRA for the low copy of transcription factor. So if, if that transcription factor bounds to one place of chromosome and that place is going to be transcribed, and different place won't be transcribed. So there will be random changes. So that's why I say, assuming they are, that those genes are going to be random with from the modeling perspective. Right? So, so basically say I'm saying there's a limited number of uh, protein molecule and there are spatial restriction, random choices. So that's introduced some uh, a randomness into gene interaction. And that's actually all we need. As soon as we assume there are a random gene interaction and then we will uh, the, the model will convert a machine aging into biological aging. That's, that's all I need uh, to, and I can even find the analytical solution. Uh, so what is this, M0? 
m0 is the initial mortality rate, and uh, g is the Gumpert's parameter for rate of aging. Now, what is n? n is the number of interactions per module. So basically, what I'm saying is, so here, uh, the more interaction I have, if I if if the number of gene interaction I have is more and my rate of aging is larger. Kind of a <laughs> what, so so basically this is a, the, the my my solution of the model. So n is the number of gene interaction here. My n is here, the number of links per essential gene. N is the number of uh, uh, modules, how many, uh, uh, how many essential genes, basically. And K is the exponential decay rate of those, uh, basically the constant rate of aging. And the, the Q is the chance of the link to be active. Basically, that's the stochastic chance. The, the chance of a link to be active is almost like a toss of coin. Except this coin is it's going to give say 0.1 or say 0.8. Is this going to work or not work? Uh, C is just a constant here. You can ignore that. So so what I have here is this. So I have the rate of aging is proportional to the here. N is the number of gene interaction, Q is the number of uh, active gene interaction. So basically, the number of active gene, gene interaction is proportional to the rate of aging. Basically, this is say the more redundancy my gene network is, the faster is the rate of aging. That actually goes back to the first, one of the earliest slides I have. The the more Redundancy a system have the sharper is the transition of the, the sharper is the increase of the rate of aging. So basically, here I, I can even show uh, mathematically that's the case. So now the interesting part is this. So here the n is here, and uh, so when the n and one minus q that's the a number less than one. So when n increase, this number is going to go decrease dramatically, become very small. So, so the more redundancy I have, the initial chance of dying is going to be very, very small. You see the point? So, so now basically I'm, I'm saying the more redundancy I have, I'm going to have a small initial mortality rate, but large rate of aging, basically the, the trade-off between the two Gumpert parameters. So, this is, this is, uh, this is just to plot it out, the two curve. So, the more interaction, uh, the more active interaction we have, we have a smaller uh, initial mortality rate, a large rate of aging. Uh, oh, I did. basically that's the uh, negative correlation between two Gumpert parameters. Uh, this is basically the model predict. And the viability curve is, so basically I'm using some uh, uh, simple uh, rate of aging to, this, to illustrate the prediction of the model. So. When the, no, the number of gene interaction and the redundancy, I'm going to generally call robustness. That's why we are studying. The redundancy is one of the mechanisms to form robustness. There are other mechanisms to form robustness, including, say, a renewal and a repair and network configuring. And we are going to touch those topics later on. It's actually part of your research direction if you are interested. I put all my uh, I put all my research proposal on the Dropbox. Uh, I, I'm also going to link it on the Moodle so that probably make it more convenient for you. And 
one of your uh, assignment is to read those proposals and figure out what you want to do and then choose that for your research direction. And of course, uh, I'm going to guide. So part of it is we are going to use gene expression to study how, how do we evaluate robustness. So but the model basically predicts this. If the network robustness increases, the drop of the viability is going to be very sharp. If, if the drop of viability becomes sharp, if you take the slope, that value is going to be large. Right? If the drop of viability becomes a, 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 a gradually, the slope change, the slope of the change will also be smaller. The rate of aging will be smaller. Basically, say the more robust the gene network is, you know, the faster is the rate of aging. And since the initial mortality rate and the, and the rate of aging is negatively correlated, and we basically say increase our robustness, you will have a smaller initial mortality rate, and decrease robustness, you have a larger initial mortality rate. And that's the prediction of the model. Uh, I think we sh I, sh I, I should pause here and 